Well, I think this last end quote of Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit, reflects the spirit of that song. Country roads take me home. I want to go home. We even say that phrase when people die, right? They, they went home to be with God. We get some comfort or some consolation in knowing that, quote, they're in a better place. And yet often people's perception of heaven is it's a boring place with clouds and harps. And it's like, what a drag. But actually, the word used in the Bible of heaven is a renewed heaven or renewed earth. Because it's actually more accurate not to say we go to heaven as much as heaven comes to earth in the final chapter of the Bible. So the things you love about the earth, you get to still experience in the next life, only without betrayal, without injustice, without plagues, without tornadoes. And so when Jesus, in this last quote, says he's willing to commit himself to God, it's not just for the next life. It's also during the challenges and crucifixions he's going through. I think committing yourself to anyone can be hard. As I mentioned, I've taken a couple of flying lessons, and it's, I feel like I'm 13 again, uh, learning how to drive my car. I bought a car a couple of years before I could drive, and I had an old field behind our house we would drive together. And oh my goodness, there's so much to think about. Well, while I was uh, taking one of my first lessons with my friend Phil as I'm uh, flying together, you know, you're like, you know, have I committed myself to the right person, to the right plane? You know, is this, is, does this make a lot of sense risk management wise? You know, it, how, how well can I trust the person who's got me in this, this situation? As we're flying along and Phil's real humbly as always uh, answering my questions and finding out he was the president of the organization that represent two thirds of all pilots, I'm starting to feel more confident. And yet I'm also finding myself, you know, death grip onto the yoke, I mean, just like fingers into the piece, like, oh my goodness, at any moment I could die kind of thing. And, and I turned to my friend Phil, I said, Phil, you must have taught a lot of people over the years, kids, grandkids maybe, is it really nerve-wracking, the difference between teaching your kids how to drive versus fly? He says, Chad, no. I'm like, well, why not? It's, it seems like it'd be stressful. He says, look down there, we're flying over 32. Look at those people make like a 32nd a, a, a of an inch mistake and people wreck. You just climbed 500 feet and you don't even know it. He goes, there's so much freedom up in the air to make mistakes. There's so much freedom to learn. There's so much freedom up here. And suddenly that struck me. I never thought of flying as something with freedom compared to driving. And all of a sudden I could feel my hands becoming a little less sweaty. Not quite the death grip on the yoke that I had. And I began to actually enjoy the process of learning how to fly. And I think for many of us think of life, the idea of surrendering ourselves or committing our spirit or our life to God, that sounds like I'm not sure I'm in good hands. I'm not sure I want to trust myself to God. I mean, when I think of life, it seems like life is maybe in unstable hands. The things we see, the things we observe, life might feel like it's in cruel hands. And yet all of us know that if we could trust the person in charge of our life, it would be easy. If we could really believe they were good, it'd be easy to trust. And so usually the journey of learning to trust someone is learning to know them, learning to understand their goodness. Because what we're going to see in Jesus' end quote today is that you're in good hands if you're in hands that are good. So the question is, are God's hands good? Because if his hands are good, then you could commit yourself to him. But that's a journey to ask that question, discover whether or not he really is. So in in the book of Luke, it gives this account, the account of the sort of final quote we're going to look at from Jesus. Here's what it says. It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. The sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So immediately there's objections, right? Oh, come on. This has to be a fairy tale. This has to be a fictional account. The sun doesn't go dark. And here's why, and certainly philosophically, if God's all-powerful, then God doing all powerful things like dampening the sun or whatever is, is certainly plausible. But the question is, if this really happens, if this really is history as you claim the Bible claims it is, there should be evidence. Now, there's several different accounts uh, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that mention this darkness, to which the objection is that circular reasoning, using the Bible to substantiate the Bible. Well, 
Was there anyone else in the world who happened to notice the darkness between the sixth and ninth hour? Wouldn't that, somebody who's not religious, not a Christian, somebody different part of the world even, who noted the darkness, that would give some validity to the fact that this maybe actually happened. Well, sure enough, we have several accounts of historians who cite this darkness and the specific hours during that time. One of them was in Greece and who noted this happening during the Olympics in 202 Olympics. In the fourth year, however, of the Olympiad 202, an eclipse of the sun happened greater and more excellent than any that had happened before it. At the sixth hour, day turned into dark night so that the stars were seen in the sky and an earthquake in Bithynia toppled many buildings in the city of Nicaea. This is Seligon, an irreligious historian writing in 110 AD. So here's somebody who was in a totally different location who cites and collaborates with the Bible claims. Now, a couple other historians reference this. I'll give you another one, sort of a historian quoting historian. In the time of Tiberius Caesar, at full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the sixth hour to the ninth. So this guy says, hey, I know it was dark. I got the times. It must have been an eclipse. To which I'd still say, amazing timing that the eclipse happened to happen when Jesus was on the cross. But there's a later historian by the name of uh, Africanus who's writing and said, whatever it was that caused the darkness that we saw couldn't have been caused by a solar eclipse. Why is that? Well, here's what he says. He quotes that guy. Salus calls this darkness, quoting another guy who is a historian, that this darkness and eclipse of the sun in the third book of his histories I think his claim that it's a, a solar eclipse, he says, is without reason to me. Why? The Hebrews celebrate the Passover on the 14th day, reckoned by the lunar calendar, and the events concerning the Savior occurred on the first day of Passover. What's he saying? He's saying, because these feasts that the Jews celebrated, like Passover, occur on specific days based on the lunar calendar, the moon would have been in the totally opposite direction where it needed to be in order to be a solar eclipse. So again, here's several historians saying there was darkness from the sixth to ninth hour. The Bible collaborates that. And they say whatever it was must have been supernatural because the moon was in the wrong location. Now, there's lots more evidence that I could support. Some of you are already like, move on, move on. My point is, how are you going to trust God is good? How are you going to trust the Bible's true if you don't look into the evidence for it? And that's why at Horizon we're yours to explore. Because Jesus is going to have to wrestle with whether he can commit himself to God in the midst of some of the darkest hours of his life. I want to give you three reasons why I think no matter where you are in your journey, you could commit yourself into the hands that are good, even in difficult times. The reason number one, the first one, is that don't we see difficulty differently when it comes from someone you trust? Don't you see difficulty differently when it comes from someone you trust, right? You hire a trainer, a dietitian, and they put you through a living hell of giving up all the good food you used to like, right? And now all of a sudden they tell you, you can't eat this and you can't eat that. And you're like, this is so cruel. This is cruel and unusual punishment. And yet you trust. They got a track record. You checked them out. Some friends of yours used them. And you're like, as, as painful as this difficult this is, I'm trusting this person that I can lose the weight I want to lose because I'm trying to train for a marathon. And maybe that's somebody else you trust. You hire a mentor, a trainer to prepare you for a, mar a marathon. And you begin to see the difficulty of the training, the regiments, the diets, the things they put you through. You see it differently because you trust them. Some of us look back and say our favorite teacher was our hardest teacher. In college, for MBA. Now, at the time, it didn't feel very great, did it? Oh, my God, I give so much homework. This is so ridiculous. I can't believe I do so much. But you look back and go, well, that teacher brought something out of me that I didn't even know was there. And if that same teacher, that same boss, that same mentor, that same coach, remember that coach that got out of you stuff that you didn't think was possible let you go to state you would say, you know, if somebody else had asked me to do the same thing, I wouldn't have trusted them. But because it came from somebody I trusted, I saw the difficulty differently. Even though I can't fully understand why you're asking me to do this, I'm going to trust. I'm going to commit myself to your authority and your leadership because I trust you. We see difficulty differently when it comes from someone we trust. I had a friend recently who was making a lot of really bad decisions. And I didn't have a great or a long-term relationship with this person, and, and they say, hey, I really want your advice on some things. And what they really need is a two-by-four upside the head for some of the bad decisions they were making. But I didn't feel like I'd earned the right to do that. 
So as they were discussing sort of the situation, uh, I said, well, would you like me just to listen or do you want advice? I really want your advice. I said, I don't really feel like we have the kind of relationship that you know me well enough to hear my advice. And so I just think it would be inappropriate for me to give unsolicited feedback or even solicited feedback when you don't know my intentions. Now, I really want to know your feedback. I just really, I don't know we have a strong enough relationship for you to get the kind of feedback that I want to give. No, no, I really want to know your feedback. Made him ask three times. And I said, all right. And I, uh, as nicely as I could, reached back and got my two by four and just said, that's a stupid thing. That's an idiotic thing. What were you thinking there? Oh, my goodness, that's not going to serve you well. Oh, my goodness, you totally uh, misconstrued the facts here. We got done with this conversation. He said, thank you. I said, really? I said, those are some tough things. He goes, no, thank you. Thank you for speaking truth. I said, well, the reason I didn't want to share that is I didn't know if you could trust that my heart was, I want you to succeed. No, I did hear that, and I do believe that. We see difficult differently when it comes from someone we trust. And so Jesus' end quote here is this. Into your hands, God his Father, I commit my spirit. I'm going to see the cross, see the difficulty I'm going through differently because it's coming from someone I trust, my Father. But that little phrase, Jesus didn't invent. That was probably a, a bedtime prayer he'd prayed since he was little. It comes from the Old Testament, Psalms chapter 31, I believe written by David, a righteous man who felt like he was going through very difficult times unfairly, being unfairly punished. And he said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Very possibly a bedtime prayer that Mary may have taught Jesus could be a bedtime that he would pray as many of the Jewish people did into your hands, God. I commit my spirit. Whatever difficulty I'm going to go through tomorrow or today, I'm going to trust the person I know is good and can work all things together for good. Now, what's interesting is that God, Jesus here, is saying he's willing to trust his father. Now, I know almost everyone I know who has a cursory knowledge of the Bible would say, I like the New Testament God, Jesus. I don't like that Old Testament God. He seems so mean. He seems so nasty. He seems so angry. He seems so jealous. Now, keep in mind, Jesus here is trusting the Old Testament God. He doesn't see him as angry or untrustworthy. While going through crucifixion, Jesus is saying, into your hands, Old Testament God hands, I trust you to go through what I'm going through. Which brings up, I think, a classic objection that people have toward the Bible, which is that I'm not sure I can trust the New Testament or Old Testament God, but definitely not the Old Testament God. Remember, Jesus is going to be in the garden praying that his father, Old Testament God, will not make him go to the cross. He'll say, Father, please take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. Take this cup from me. But if there's no other way for people to get forgiveness, no other way for people to know for sure they're going to heaven, no other way people can be free from guilt and shame, not my will, but yours be done. That's Jesus again committing himself to his father. Because, as he'll say later or earlier in his life, the thing about my dad is he's so strong that when you're in my dad's hands, my dad's good hands, no one can snatch you out of my dad's hands. So if Jesus could trust the Old Testament God, why is it hard for us? And here's why I think why. Because many of us have heard that God in the Old Testament is jealous and he's like killing people all the time. So let me just give you one quick example as to why I think that's worth investigating. The Bible covers thousands of years of history, and there are a few, probably five, specific examples of some pretty tragic things going on. And I would propose to you that there are cultural circumstances going around that explain that what's going on are the ethics of war, the ethics of justice, and there are specific parameters that help explain that. I'll give you a modern example. There was a nation that came in and obliterated an entire city in our history. I mean, men, women, children, devastation. That nation that destroyed an entire city, with just totally um, obliterated it, is that nation inherently good or bad? I don't know. Are we talking about Hitler? I don't know. Are we talking about Stalin? No, I'm referring to when we dropped the bomb in Japan. Now, was that horrible? Of course it was horrible. Did innocent people die? Of course they did. But what was going on there? And you look at the cultural setting and you go, oh, because we're at war, 
because we had a particular society that had an honor based cultural system and which uh, the dishonor of surrender was worse than actually, you know, losing your life in battle. As the pros and cons were weighed, a smaller amount of people would die with one bomb so that more people people could be freed. Yet a little bit more uh, historical context to that, you find out we, we dropped pamphlets to warn people to get out. And after the bomb was dropped, we helped rebuild the city. All of the things don't fully explain the whole situation, but they help go, oh my goodness, there was more going on there than just the initially, wow, those seem like cruel people. And I would propose to you, when you look at the things you see in the book of Joshua and the book of Samuel, those are the exception to the rule. And there are specific cultural examples that help explain why there was that particular thing going on there. Because what you see 90% of the time, 99% of the time in the Bible, the Old Testament is a gracious, loving, patient. I'm like, how can you be so patient with these people at the time of God? So much so that even if you're not sure you are convinced by that, Jesus going on the cross felt like he could commit himself to the difficulty in his life because he trusted this God, this Father. So we see things differently, difficulty differently with somebody we trust. But the second reason I think we should entrust ourselves is because you're always putting yourselves in the hands of something. See, I think one of the objections is, I'm not sure I can trust God. I don't want to put my, my, myself, my life, my future in anything else's hands. But I would suggest to you that all of us put ourselves, our very lives, into other people's hands all the time. I say it because it feels like, you know, those people way over there must have a lot of faith. I, I don't have enough faith that I could ever commit myself like that. You have already today committed your life to people you don't even know. How many of you know your brake technician who put your brakes on? Now, your ability to stop, turn, not slam into something is dependent upon those brakes working. How many of you know how calipers work? How many of you have ever blood breaks? I bet you, well, uh, maybe when I was, you know, I, what do they mean? You go flying. How many of you fly for travel? Do you know the pilot? Have you checked his credentials? And of course, when you first fly, remember how nervous you are? You get into your first plane, you're like, oh my goodness, I might die on this thing. And somebody tries to console you and says, don't worry, you're not going to die. It's not your time to go. Okay. What if it's the pilot's time to go? <laughs> you know, there's more fears come up, right? Whether it's trusting people are going to stop at a stop sign or stop at a stoplight. Well, I would say even beyond that, if you're not committing yourself to God, you're committing yourself to something. I find my identity in being independent. I can't commit myself to God because I've got more trust in committing myself to my need for independence, my need to be in control. Whether it's control controlling you, independence controlling you, people's perception of you controlling you, your resume controlling you, your latest accomplishment controlling you or defining you. The truth is that all of us are controlled by something all the time. The question is, how trustworthy is that thing? Because notice Jesus says, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's lots of hands out there that you can put your life in. The question is, can I commit myself to his hands? Are his hands good? Jesus has been going through some difficult times. He tells his disciples in a different account that... The Son of Man, that's how he referred to himself, is about to be trade into the hands of men. So even when he was in circumstances in the hands of men, where he was being betrayed and spit upon and crucified and just horrific things done to him, he said, even though it looks like I'm in the hands of men, in the hands of difficulty, in the hands of challenge, I am really in the hands of my Heavenly Father, who I trust to work these difficult circumstances through to a higher purpose. It's a great quote by G.K. Chesterton as he reflects on how he was able to trust a God with his life, both here and later. He uses the analogy of a key. Here's how he says it. If I found a key on the road and I discovered that, that it fit and opened a particular lock at my house, I would assume most likely that that key was made by a lockmaker. If I find a set of teachings set out in the pre-modern oriental society that has proven itself of such universal validity that it has fascinated and satisfied millions of people in every century, he goes on, 
including the best minds in history, as well as the simplest hearts, that it was made itself at home in virtually every culture, inspired masterpieces of beauty in every field of art, continues to grow rapidly and spread and assert itself in lands where a century ago the name of Jesus Christ was not even heard. If such teaching so obviously fits the locks of so many human souls in so many times and so many places, are they likely to be the work of a deceiver or a fool? In fact, it is more likely they were designed by the heart maker. And what he's saying is you're going to commit yourself to something. The evidence suggests that this key, this teaching that fits so many types of people in so many cultures through time that has transformed the world would be worth committing your life to. That's what he's saying here. So if you're going to commit your life to something, why not to the key maker? Thirdly, I think many of us from the time we're in high school and on, we think we have a commitment problem. You know, the reason I can't commit to God is because I've got a commitment problem. I can depend on me, but nobody else. The Bible has a really interesting diagnosis. The Bible says we don't have a commitment problem. The biggest problem in the human heart is not belief in God or not. The biggest question in the human heart is, is God good? In the first chapters of Genesis, the first question that comes up is, is God good? Is he holding out on you? Would he screw up your life if you committed yourself to him? So the question is not, do you have a commitment problem? You commit yourself to stuff every day. The question is, you have a question about his goodness. Is God the kind of good hands that I'd want to commit myself to? So case study. In the crucifixion of Jesus, as he is dying there, most men shriveled up as they were dying because it was death by suffocation. You never talked on the cross. You couldn't even get enough <gasps> breath to breathe. The centurion, which would be the equivalent of an eyewitness account of a secret service agent, is included here in this account by Luke, who interviewed the eyewitnesses. So he takes the most skeptical person, a centurion, a mercenary, a man very aware of death. He's seen thousands of people die on the cross and he's not got a bleeding heart. Poor Jesus, look at him on the cross. I mean, he's, he's put him there. And yet his eyewitness account, watching Jesus die, he's never seen anything like this. And this skeptical centurion, seeing Jesus die, asserts that was a good man. That was a righteous man. More than that, it says, watching Jesus die, he, the centurion, following the Greek Roman gods of the Zeus and, and, and Dionysus and all that, he starts worshiping the God that Jesus talked about. He glorified God and said, certainly that was a righteous man. Now notice right before that, it says Jesus cried out in a loud voice. This was unheard of in crucifixion. Jesus, rather than sort of withering away, Jesus is up on that cross like a champion, like a warrior. And he cries out in a loud voice, Into your hands I commit my spirit! Time to die. <laughs> this centurion's never seen this. This guy's bold, brash. He's been still in control. He's got his head high as if he's calling the shots while he's being crucified. This centurion is so struck, he's never seen a loud voice. He's never seen someone die like this. Not only the forgiveness, but with the boldness. And he calls his own time of death, so much so that this eyewitness account from Luke says, that right there was the Son of God. And Luke includes this so that when we have doubts, but for wonderings, he doesn't just include the religious people giving evidence, he includes the skeptical people giving evidence. There's an old religious book that was sort of a case study in almost every religion class you take. It's called World Religions. And in that, it cites that there's really, of all the different world religions, there's two main people who've been very transformative in their influence. In the book, the uh, author Smith says, you know, there are two people whose life, whose teaching was so profound. People just didn't just say, who are you? People said, what are you? And that was Buddha. And Jesus. But if you look at the common response to Buddha and Jesus, their answers were almost the opposite when people asked the question, Who are you? People wanted to worship Jesus. 
A monotheistic Jew who knows there's only one God, and the one rule you never break as a Jew is only God should be worshipped, Jesus. People tried to worship Jesus. How did he respond? People tried to worship Buddha. How did he respond? Totally opposite reaction. When people tried to worship Buddha, he says, don't worship me. It's not about me. It's about my teaching. It's about my dogma. Take my teaching. May it lead you to something. Please don't worship me. What's striking is that Jesus should have been the last person, a Jewish rabbi, who would ever let people worship him. Over and over through the accounts, you see this monotheistic Jew letting people worship him, his disciples, his crowds. In this case, a Roman centurion glorified or worshipped him as God. Jesus says, it's not about my teaching. It's primarily about me. I am the life. I am the truth. I am God. I am the God you've been longing for. The search is over. What you've been looking for, what you've been searching for, it is me. And if you're worshiping me, you've found the truth. This is either an egomaniac, as C.S. Lewis says, a person who's on the same level as someone who thinks they're a poached egg. Yeah, worship me. Gorsh. Or a liar. But what kind of liar makes the kind of impact in human history and allows the 12 people who knew him best to die as martyrs for what he said, or he really is who he says he was. Which again brings up the objection, yeah, yeah, but I, I just don't think I can believe in a God like that. I mean, Richard Dawkins is probably the classic on this. He'd say, you know, when I think of the Old Testament God, I think somebody who's petty and puny. I think of somebody who's capricious and sedimentistic, and he's a benevolent bully, he would say. And here's how the argument goes. You cannot believe in a good God... Because if God is good and God is powerful, there shouldn't be evil in the world. Since there is evil in the world, God is either good, he knows about it, but he's not powerful, he can't do anything about it. Or, if God is powerful enough to do something about it, and he knows that it's there, but he doesn't do anything about it, then God must not be good. Therefore, because there's evil in the world, God is either not good or not powerful. Conclusion, there's no such thing as a good, powerful God. It's a pretty substantial objection, especially as I'm asking you to think about committing yourself to a God that I say is good. What's the answer to that? Well, the last 50 years of philosophy, philosophers have pretty solidly debunked this, and they've shown that hidden in this philosophical question is an assumption. The assumption in the question is that because I observe evil that I think is meaningless, because I, I can't imagine any good coming out of it, therefore there must not be a good reason for it. That's the little philosophical thing that snuck into this equation. Because you can't imagine good coming out of this evil, there must not be any good coming out of the evil. And this is where the cross answers that question. If you were to ask any of the disciples, if you were to ask anyone observing what happened that day on Calvary, can God be good to let his son, his exact representation, die such a cruel, painful death? No, God is not good. Nothing good could come out of this. The Romans considered you cursed. The Jews considered you cursed. They even had a verse in their book that said, if you hang on a tree, it's like the worst case scenario. So they would say, this is the ultimate example of meaningless suffering. Nothing good could ever come out of a cross. In fact, they invented a word because of the screams coming out of the cross were so loud. They made up a word. It was called excruciating pain, out of the cross pain. And yet we have the advantage 2,000 years later of saying, oh my goodness, what seemed like meaningless suffering, a God who is not in control... Jesus says, no, this is exactly what was predicted to happen. I was paying for what you'd done wrong. This is exactly, we were on plan. When it looked most meaningless, that God was most out of control, I was most in his hands. When it looked like nothing good can come out of this, how many of you have seen somebody with a cross around their neck? The cross is not a symbol of ancient torture, as any Roman or Greek would tell you. It's now a symbol of forgiveness, of joy, of peace. God took something seemingly meaningless suffering and turned into the ultimate symbol of victory, the ultimate symbol of forgiveness, the ultimate symbol of peace. And so here at the cross, we get the the, the problem of evil is answered. Because as that message spreads, it's not just personal changes. The world begins to change. The value of the handicap goes up. People's generosity goes up. One historian said the Romans gave nothing to anyone. 
financially except themselves. The ethics of family go up. Women's liberation goes up as people are esteemed, as as co-made in God's image. All through the world, the Roman Empire crumbles in its ethics as this Christian idea, as the catapult of the resurrection, begins to spread across the world. And here we are 2,000 years later, a sign that what seemed like meaningless suffering and no good controlling God could ever be in charge here has transformed the Western world, the Eastern world, and all of modern history. So as you wonder, can I commit to a God who's good when you're going through your own darkness, your own difficulty, your own like nothing good can come out of this? What God would say to you and I is the same thing. If you will trust that I am good, I will work in and through these circumstances. You heard John Denver in that interview we showed earlier mention his dad Dutch. What you may not know is that Dutch actually used to fly planes for a guy named Bill Ray, Fay rather, who did some pretty illegal activity with the mob. As Bill began to travel back and forth doing some illegal activities for many years, Dutch was uh, one of his co-pilots. Well, Bill eventually came to realize that maybe the illegal things he was doing and maybe the whole lifestyle he'd created, uh, maybe he needed something more. And he began to investigate the claims of Jesus. And Bill came to the place of realizing he needed forgiveness, he needed leadership, and that Jesus was who he says he was. And the biblical account was true. And so Bill came to become a follower of Jesus. He said to Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit, my life now and my life to come. His life transformation was so significant that Dutch, John Denver's dad, noticed his friend changing in positive ways. What happened to you? And Bill shared with Dutch his journey to faith in Jesus. And Dutch, too, became a follower of Jesus. One day they were talking, they hadn't seen John in years, so, I mean, Bill hadn't, and as Dutch was getting sicker and sicker, he said, you listen, if you ever have an opportunity to tell my son John about this Jesus that's transformed your life and mine, will you do it? He said, well, I can't imagine, as popular as he is now, I'll ever run into him, but I promise you that if I have the opportunity, I will. One day, Bill was now a pastor, he was sitting in the airport, As he was sitting in the airport waiting room, he saw, sure enough, sitting in that same airport was John Denver. He walked over. He says, John. John, having a lot of of fans at that point, says, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. He's like, actually, you've never seen me. (laughs) Oh, okay. He says, but I knew your dad, Dutch, really well. We flew for years together. He says, and I don't know if you're open to this, but your dad asked me. I know he's deceased now, but your dad told me that if I ever had an opportunity, I was supposed to share with you the most important thing in my life and the most important thing in your father's life. So John Denver and Bill sat in that airport for an hour and a half that day, Bill says, and went through the basic essentials of what it means to believe that we don't live up to our own standards, let alone God's, this problem called missing the mark that Drew talked about last week, the fact that no amount of good deeds can ever offset the amount of bad deeds you've done because every new opportunity you do is much bad as you do good, that you need to be rescued from your good works and your bad works. Bad works, what you've done wrong, and your good works, thinking they're good enough. They came to the end of that discussion that day, and Bill turned to John Denver and said, Do you see any reason why you wouldn't want to entrust or commit yourself to Jesus right now? John Denver scratched his head and said, Not now. Not now. I'm young. I've got plenty of time to think about religious stuff. I've got plenty of time to think about that kind of thing. One month later is when he had this accident. I don't know where his faith is or isn't. And there's certainly no pressure or yours to explore wherever you're at in your journey, whatever the issues are you're struggling with or wrestling with on God's goodness. But I also don't want you to miss the moments. John Denver's end quote is a reminder that not all of us, few of us, none of us like Jesus call our time of death. We don't know how much time we have. And waiting to put spiritual journey, spiritual thoughts, sp- spiritual pilgrimages, sort of at the bottom of the to-do list, ever, every, every conceivable thing we've ever thought of is done, it might be time to move that up in the stack. More than that, if God is good, and if the ultimate forgiveness is offered to you, why would you not want to commit yourself to a God who is willing to go through this for you and me? You're in good hands in your life. If those hands are good. So my encouragement is this. What the cross shows us is that you can commit yourself to God 
in your mountaintop experiences, when you're at the top of your game, that's the best time to commit yourself to God. But also, Jesus on the cross reminds us that when you're in the deepest valley, it's the best time to commit yourself to God. Because you're like, nothing else is working out real well. I need something secure here. I need to know that nothing can snatch me out of God's hand. I need to know that some, some kind of purpose could come out of this. And the cross reveals to us that in this life, there is a God who can empathize with you. He has been through temptation. He has been through grief. He has been through the pain of somebody betraying him. The cross also reminds us that Jesus had it all. He was actually going to be chosen as king at one point. He turned it down because he did not trust the hearts of men. He goes, I will trust the heart of my father over people who are going to make me king. We all have a king in our life. We all have something we've committed ourselves to. God is the one thing that is secure and does not change. I love this last song by Vince Gill because it is the absolute promise that if God can turn the valley of the cross into the mountain of his victory, then you too can hand over your valley to him and he can bring the hope and the love and the courage you need to know that he can be in control and you can have the confidence of heaven even in an uncertain world. Go to heaven a shouting. That's what Jesus did. He cried out in a loud voice, into your hands I'm committing my spirit. I could not be in a safer place than my Father's hands. As we head to Easter, maybe you want to make this that deciding moment for you. Maybe today you just want to say the words Jesus said in prayer. I'm going to lead you into prayer. And put it in your own words, but let's put it in Jesus' words. If you want to bow your heads with me, just say, God, into your hands I commit my spirit. And for some of us, That's committing our spirit because we want to be in heaven with him and see our fathers and our sisters and our grandmothers again. Others of us, maybe you want to say it again, but this time think about a specific circumstance. Think about what you're going through, things not going well, challenges before you. Think about that situation and say it again. God, into your hands, I commit this circumstance. God, we ask for your courage, your comfort, and your strength for each person here. God, that we could trust that if you could take an old rugged cross and use it to transform the world, you could use whatever challenges we're going through to transform us and transform the world as well. God, we thank you for who you are and how gracious you are to allow us to doubt, to question, and to journey towards you, Father. And I ask that each person could know the confidence of knowing they could be in heaven with you, a shouting. In Jesus' name.